If you could choose a one-word goal for your life that you want to achieve in your life, what would that one word be? That is the question that I posed on our church-wide Slack this week. And if you're not a part of that and you want to be a part, you know, get on a service team or get in a community group and you can get on that Slack. It's probably the best way. Or just ask and we'll put you on. We don't care. Anyway, but... uh, I asked on the churchwide Slack this week, and here's some themes that I got. Everybody answered a little bit different, but some basic themes that I got was, I want to be successful. And being successful, I think, is a really good thing. We, uh, we, we want to be successful in life in general, so it's a, that's a good thing. Other people said, I want to be happy, fulfilled, or have peace, or something along those lines, which is also really good. The scriptures often talk about what it means to be a happy, fulfilled, or a person that lives at peace. And actually, the entrance of Christ into our life should fill us with those things. Um, so we all want those. The third thing uh, that people answered with as the one word that they want to achieve in their life is integrity. They want to live as a moral person, a good person in the very end. And absolutely, the scriptures back this up, and that is a Really wonderful thing, and all these are very good. But I think there is one word that is foundational, and actually a few people answered with this one word. There's one word that's foundational, and I think in God's eyes, it stands above the rest, but just because out of this comes all these other good things. If you're a Christian today, one day you will stand before God, and he'll look at your life, and then he will make a judgment on if you, um, how you lived your life and if you served him in all you did. And when we get to the end of life, he's not going to say, well done, my good and successful servant. Well done, my good and happy servant or good and moral servant, even as good as those things are. At the end of our lives, he will say, if we have followed him faithfully, well done, my good and faithful servant servant. So today, what I want to do is I want to talk about faithfulness. I want to look at what it is from the scriptures and then how Jesus talks about faithfulness. Let's first go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this building that's cool, uh, that we can come and we can worship you in. What a, what a uh, immense privilege it is that we can be here together. Lord, thank you for Those that have come here, God, you deserve our worship. You deserve for all of us to worship in the way that we sing, worship in the way that we we interact with people today, worship in the way we listen to your word and then respond to your word. Lord, you deserve all of that worship today. Lord, I pray that today as we look into uh, your word, I pray that you would help us to understand those things that are difficult. Lord, the things that we do understand, but... They're still difficult to do. I pray that you would give us the power and the strength to do them. God, I pray that we would uh, hear from you and we would obey. For though the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of our Lord stands forever. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the middle of a series called Predecide. We've been predeciding um, uh, how we're going to live our life in certain places. So, We realize that the power of our decisions is going to direct our lives because our decisions uh, determines the quality of the life we're going to live. And every week I've said we make our decisions, but ultimately what ends up happening is our decisions end up making who we are. The problem is with this is we're not all good decision makers as I have made plain week to week for myself. What we've said is instead of waiting for that the heat of the moment, the, the moment where we are at our weakest to make a decision, we're going to make a decision beforehand. We're going to pre-decide. So how do we know when to make these pre-decisions, as the series is called? Well, we said, look at where your values are, who you want to be in life, and then look where you struggle with being who you want to be. And those areas that you can, you can pinpoint, those areas are the places that you're going to want to pre-decide things, places where you struggle. And we've uh, gone through all kinds of different ones, but we came up with this equation here. When faced with blank situation, I have pre-decided to blank, take a specific action. So I've given a different example every single week. This week, I'm going to jump to community groups uh, because Matt would want me to. And when faced with not feeling like going to community group, I have pre-decided to text my community group leader and ask if I should go. 
Let me tell you, your community group leader is always going to tell you to go because right now the only two community group leaders are me and Matt, and we're always going to say, yes, you should go to community group. So, uh, so th there you go. So if you're having an issue going, you know, community group, maybe that's a pre-decide you want to write on your course folder today. But every week we've looked at something a little bit different. The first, time, first week we looked at temptation. How do we fight the temptations that we run into in life? Then we looked at what does it mean to be a consistent person, someone that is consistently there, consistently uh, living the life that, they're, that God's called them to live? A few weeks ago, we looked at how to be devoted to God. Last week, we looked at generosity. Next week, we'll look at, finish the whole thing off with uh, seeing how we can be finishers, finish well in life. I think as we get to the end of our lives, that's all, something we're all going to want to do and hope we can do. This week, we're going to look at being faithful. Faithful is never something that is done on accident, day in and day out, week to week, year to year. You're never a faithful person on accident. It is hard. It takes intentionality and discipline to be a faithful person. And why is it that it is so difficult to be faithful? I think it's because I, I know myself, and I can only speak for myself, but I, I see it, I think, in, in other people too, is because we want to um, take the easy or more convenient way. And being faithful means making the hard choices and making the hard decisions. And faithfulness is making the right choice because it's the right choice, not because we're going to get anything good out of it. In fact, the, um, the only thing you may get by being faithful to God is knowing that you were faithful to God. And that's okay. You did the right thing. Faithfulness is hard because it will often cost you. There's plenty of things in life that cost us. We don't mind paying uh, for things that are going to cost us as long as it's worth it. And I will tell you this. Faithfulness is going to cost you. but It is always, always worth it. Let me read to you out of Habakkuk 2, verse 4. In the New Living Translation, it says, Look at the proud. Now, don't, don't look around right now. That, that's um, rhetorical, you, you know. Um, <laughs> Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and, in, and their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The proud trust in themselves. They trust in their money. They trust in their careers. They trust in their ability, intelligence, and all these things. They trust in themselves. And when we trust in ourselves, we tend to bend away from who and what and where God wants us to be. I know. <laughs> so often I trust in myself. I want to do it because I don't think God, the God of the universe, can have it in control. Now I'm going to kind of Bible nerd out here for just a second. And if you're not a Bible nerd and you're like, Oh, this is, this is too much. This is a great time to fill out your Connect card and come back in just a minute. So uh, if you're a Bible nerd today, you're going to realize here that this verse here in Habakkuk 2.4 sounds very familiar. It says, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And it's very familiar because we find it in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. The righteous, maybe you've heard it read, the righteous will live by their faith to God or their faith now, you probably see a note, and maybe in your translation of the scriptures in Habakkuk 2, for his little letter there, and it says that it's, um, it, or faithfulness, because your translation probably says by faith and not, or, uh, but it'll say or faithfulness. Now, why does it do that, and why is there some ambiguity there, whether it's faith or faithfulness? Because those are kind of two different ways of thinking about something, for sure. Well, whenever there's ambiguity in Old Testament Hebrew, which is a very old, ancient language, they go to what is known as the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint. And the Septuagint has a word there, and this is a great word, uh, is pisteos, okay? Pisteos, and that is just faithfulness or faith. And it's most often translated faith in the New Testament, which is why in Romans, when Paul quotes from Habakkuk, they translate it faith. Now, the original Hebrew word, though, is a word called emunah, which means steadfastness or faithfulness. And that is why here in the New Living Translation, which I think they get it right, and many scholars believe that the word should be faithfulness there, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God, their steadfastness and trust in God. So if uh, you're like, you read that verse, and you're like, oh, well, that's weird, never heard that before. 
uh, is Ivy trying to pull something over on us? No. There's a good reason for it, and I, as I studied it, that's what I came to this week. So that word faithfulness, I believe, is the better translation here in Habakkuk 2.4. All right, so you can come back now. Hopefully you finish your Connect card. You can drop that in the box in the back. But anyway, what does it practically mean to be a faithful person? I mean, it means to be faithful to your spouse. Do not cheat on them. Yes, it definitely means that. Don't cheat on your taxes. Absolutely. Do not cheat on your taxes. Jesus says pay your taxes. Be a good person. Absolutely. Those are all what it means to be faithful. But Jesus really talks about faithfulness in three different categories in the Gospels. First is how we treat people, how we take care of our resources, and how we respond to God. How we treat people, take care of our resources, and how we Respond to God. Today we're going to pre-decide that every interaction is an opportunity to love. Every resource is an opportunity to multiply. And every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. First, every interaction is an opportunity to love. Everywhere you go, every person you meet or every person you see on Zoom or, or whatever is an opportunity to bless that person, to walk into the room and add value to the people around you. That is a form of faithfulness. But the problem with this is it's asking a lot because people are hard to love. And if you don't think people are hard to love, you need to get out more because people are very difficult to love. Uh, and you at times, and me at times, very difficult to love. You can ask my wife. She still chooses to love me even when I'm unlovely. And that's just how it is. People are hard. And we're pre-deciding areas where we struggle because it is hard. It doesn't just happen on accident. And the reason that people are so hard is because we butt heads because we become ourselves so focused on ourselves. And I can prove it to you that you are focused on yourself. When you see a picture and there's eight people in that picture, who's the first person you look at? Yourself. You look at yourself in the picture. Because if you look good in that picture, what is that picture? It is a good picture. It doesn't matter if everybody else looks horrible, but if you look good in that picture, it is a good picture. One that you're probably going to post and probably crop everybody out of and put as your, uh, your, um, your uh, uh, Facebook or Instagram uh, picture or whatever. You're going to get it up there. But on the contrary, if everybody else looks great in the picture and they are just on their game, but you yourself have like one eye closed, your mouth hanging open, it just caught you at the perfectly wrong moment, and you look like that, you look at that picture, everybody else could look great in it, but you're going to look at that picture and say, that is a terrible picture, I don't want to ever see it again, burn it to the ground, and if you tag, it, tag me in it, I know that you hate me, and uh, I'm going to, you know, cut you off from my relationship uh, with you or something, you know. Uh, and so when we look at pictures, we end up looking at ourselves. Um, the same thing can happen when we interact with people, when we enter into a conversation. Have you ever thought this before? And maybe it's, it's just me. I, I remember in high school, I dealt with this so much, and you're so insecure in high school. I get it. But I still deal with it today. Maybe you deal with it too. Walk into a conversation, you're talking, and when you leave that conversation, you think to yourself, ah, oh, did I say something stupid? Oh, did I look dumb when I, when I was in there? Are they going to like me? Did I embarrass myself? Or something along those lines. And what happens is we walk into conversations and we end up making conversations to others often about ourselves and how we looked in those conversations. But what if, because we were secure in who God has made us to be, that we pre-decide that every conversation we have is not about us and what we look like and what we can get out of it, but we have a holy confidence that enables us to f focus on other people. To walk into a conversation and say, how can I help this person? How can I love them well now? How can I add value to their life by being a part of this conversation? That, that is a form of faithfulness. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 4.29. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Walk into conversations looking for a way to build other people up. Conversations aren't all about you. You walk into a room 
be a blessing, make others' lives better, uh, help them become more faithful in their walk because you walked in the room. Do you know somebody like that? Maybe you've met somebody like that, that whenever they walk in the room, you're like, wow, everybody, it, it blesses everybody that this person is here. Let's all try to be that type of person. When I think of the, uh, the person most like that, I think of Jesus. I mean, it makes sense. If you ever watched the TV show The Chosen, I think they do such a wonderful job of this. I encourage you to watch it. You can download the app on Apple, um, uh, the App Store or Play Store or Google. And you watch Jesus interact. He always adds value and love into every situation. Even sometimes it's tough love, but it is, it is love. When his disciples are worried and they're afraid that they're going to be killed or he's going to be killed, he doesn't go to them and say, yeah, that's right, the world's all going to hell in a handbasket. You should be scared. That, you, you should ter- be terrified and run for your life. You know, have you seen the Supreme Court? Have you seen what's going on right now? No, he says. He says, don't worry. Seek first the kingdom of God. All of these things will be added unto you. He finds the woman that's caught in adultery. She's thrown in front of him, and there's all these people around her that are going to stone her. And Jesus walks into the situation. He doesn't look at her and say, when he's the only one that, uh, uh, there's, he's the only one that can judge her, he doesn't look at her and say, shame on you. How dare you? You cheated on your husband. Not what he does. He ends up actually writing in the ground. He writes in the ground something that we don't know what he writes, but it's something that makes all the people, all the men around that are going to stone her walk away. Walk away, and it's just Jesus and that woman. And he says, where are your accusers? Because they've left. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. It brings love and value. Go your life and be faithful going forward. The Apostle Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus is, you really think of a friend as someone who's there at your most difficult moments. That's your true friend. And Peter was supposed to be friend of, he was friend of the friend. He was like the deepest friend. He's in, the, in Jesus' inner circle. And he, at the moment when Jesus needs him most, Peter denies him. And not just one time says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then comes back and says, yeah, I am one of his disciples. No, three different times Peter denies him. When Jesus meets back up with him. I actually, got, when I went to Israel, I got to go to the rock where Jesus cooked breakfast for them. It's amazing. Um, amazing place that they've marked that. I went there, and it's at that rock that Jesus looks at Peter. And he says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, feed my sheep. And he says it to him three different times. He doesn't say, I can't trust you anymore. You're on the wrong side. You're out of my life. That's not what he does. He says, I forgive you. And he says, now going forward in your life, live faithfully. Every interaction that we have is an opportunity to love, an opportunity to encourage people. It's an opportunity to add value to their lives. And none of us know how a single word of encouragement might build somebody up help them. When COVID hit a couple of years ago, everybody, all of us in this room were thrown for a loop. Um, there's no doubt. I'm sure everybody had kind of existential questions. I mean, seriously, am I going to survive this? We had no idea really what was going on. And um, my biggest question that I asked was, is this, is this the end of the church? Like, is this the end? Have we reached a point where we're just not going to be able to do this anymore? Um, and I really got to a point where I was having pressure from all kinds of different sides. The future of the church was in doubt. I didn't know what to do. I had a pastor friend of mine, and he kind of just grilled me. It's kind of a tough love moment, you know. He looked at me. He says, has God called you? Yes. Has he called you to Jamaica Plain? I said, yes. He said, then he's going to give you everything you need to make it through. It was that word of encouragement is the reason that I'm probably still here right now. Never know how a single word of encouragement might help someone. And this is something that's really easy to act on. Something that I uh, heard a long time ago is when somebody does something, just encourage them. Somebody does something you like, encourage them. Say, hey, that was great. Thank you for doing that. Uh, somebody gets a new haircut. Man, your hair is looking great today. It is 
on point. Just encourage them. You never know how that might lift someone up, and that's kind of silly, but there's other things that are maybe a bigger deal that you can encourage people. Just when it comes to mind, and when you see it, don't wait. Don't text it later. In the moment, right there, encourage someone. You never know how it might help them. So every interaction is an opportunity to love, but every resource is an opportunity to multiply. In Matthew 25, we read about a, a businessman the businessman was going on a journey, and he trusted his servants with his money. He gives one servant five bags of gold. He calls them talents, but that's a, a bag of gold, a certain weight of gold. He gives him five bags of gold. He gives another servant two bags of gold, and finally gives one servant one bag of gold. And the servants with the five bags and the two bags, as the master's gone, they invest that. They risk uh, the master's money with the intention of um, receiving back some, uh, some of the investment, making more on the investment. And they end up doubling the investment. So the one with five has 10, and the one with two gets four. So they invest, and they, uh, they earn some money on it. And so his master comes back, and he looks at the servants that, that invested that money, what he had given them. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge many things. Share your master's joy. That word there is the word I mentioned earlier for faithful. It is the word pistos, which is uh, a person who shows, this is the King James Version New Testament Greek lexicon. It says, a person who shows themselves faithful in transactions of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. Be faithful. One of the most faithful acts that you can do is take what God has given to you and multiply it. If God's given you an old house, like he's given me, a hundred-year-old house, praise God, we got a house in Boston, it's a miracle, but it's this old house, and it's, some places are falling apart, you know, but we're trying to multiply what God has given us and take care of what God has given us. He's given you um, a clunker of a car, you know, make it the cleanest clunker on the road, right? Uh, and everybody's like, wow, that is a really old car, but that person really takes care of it, you know? You have a job, work hard at it. Be the best employee that you can be because the scriptures tell us that you're not just working for your boss, which is often very hard, but you are working for the Lord. You have a body, take care of your body. You have kids, disciple your children. And and any blessing that God has given you, make it better because he has entrusted you. The scriptures use a word called steward. We steward what God has given us. We multiply. Now, uh, vocational ministry is when you are paid to be in ministry. Uh, at least in this room, as far as I understand, uh, maybe there's somebody else in here, but as far as I understand, only me and Matt in here are voc- in vocational ministry, meaning we're paid to do what's here. And everybody else here is a volunteer um, today, or you're just an attender. Um, and and that's, that's fine. But so I'm going to ask the question, and I just want everybody to see it. Uh, how many of you are not in vocational ministry? Just raise your hand real quick. If you're not in vocational ministry, you do something else and don't get paid to do ministry. Okay, that's, that's most everyone. Very good. So the, uh, the thought can be sometimes is like, ah, oh, well, that's kind of like second-class citizenship in the kingdom of God. That the real, like, you know, uh, big-time workers in the kingdom of God are the pastors and the you know, worship leaders in the whatever, whatever position in the church that you can think of. And that's not something that we see uh, in the Scriptures at all. That we see that no matter what we do, we work in a way that honors God, and working in a way that honors God, where God has us is one of the most faithful things that we can do in life. That through your work or the business that you own or that you run or manage, if you are faithful to God there and you're multiplying his kingdom and you are reflecting Christ in those things and you are being a blessing to others, then you are being faithful. Whether working or studying or creating, you can be just as faithful as me and Matt can be by working in the church. Being faithful where God has you. The word that we use often. It's the word vocation. Vocation comes from the idea of calling. Vocal, you hear it in there. A calling. 
And we use that word, uh, what are you called to do? And we can often use it in the church, but people use it outside the church. What is your vocation? What are you called to do? Well, the calling idea is something that is based out of the scriptures that all of us have been called by God to do different things. We're all on the same team. We just, some of us have different roles. We are paid so that we can dedicate more time to the work of the church for some of us, but the rest of us are still working to glorify God where God has us. So uh, we take care of what God has given us and we multiply it. As a church, we also want to multiply what God has given us. Last week, I talked about tithing. Well, maybe what you don't know is when you do tithe to the church, the church actually gives a tithe. We give a portion of everything that comes into churches. We give it to missionaries. We give it to start other churches here in the city, outside the city, around the world, internationally, all those things. Um, and we give it to service projects all over. Every dollar that you give to this church, there is a portion of that dollar that is going to go to uh, support Afghani and Ukrainian refugees that um, are seeking asylum here and also in other countries around the world. Every time you give, we give a portion of that money away. We want to see, we want to take what God has given us and we want to multiply it in the world. We don't just preach it, we believe it, so we want to live it. And that's what it really means to believe it. You can say you believe it, but if you don't actually live it, you really believe it. So we want to, uh, we want to live it out. There was this one guy, one guy that got one talent, one bag of gold, and he was afraid. And this is what he says. He says, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. He gives him back the bag of gold. His master replied to him, you evil and lazy servant. It was those that risked and multiplied that were faithful with what God had given them. The one that buried it, the one that squandered it, the one that squandered his time, not only was he lazy, he says he was evil. Let us not be the type of people that squander what God has given us. Multiply it, invest it. Be faithful in every interaction. It's an opportunity for love. Be faithful with our resources, an opportunity to multiply. And third and finally, every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. God. Listen to the, the Apostle Paul's farewell address to the church in Ephesus as he leaves them in the book of Acts. He says, And now I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Holy Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town the Holy Spirit warns me. Chains and afflictions are waiting for me. Remember when I said being faithful may not always mean good things? He's being faithful. He's listening to the Holy Spirit, knowing the chains and afflictions are waiting for him in all these towns that he knows he has to go to by God's will. But I consider my life of no value to myself, my purpose, to finish my course in the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus, testify to the gospel of God's. We faithfully follow the Lord. There are going to be moments in life when we are compelled. We feel a deep burden, a compelling by the Holy Spirit to go do something. As Paul says here, I was compelled by the Spirit. He says um, to receive, uh, to finish the course and the ministry, I received from the Lord. He's compelled, he receives it from the Lord, and he wants to act and be faithful on what God has brought to him. There's going to be times when the Lord compels you to go do this, say this, go here, be there. Got to be faithful. Um, when we were in high school, Allie had a friend who she met at Chick Fil A, and uh, they really, you know, really uh, struck it in friendship and uh, friends with her to this day. But when she met her, she realized that she didn't go to church and said, "Hey, why don't you come to church with me?" And so this friend of hers goes to church with her. And church revolutionizes her entire life. What we didn't know, or what Allie didn't know, when she asked her friend to come, was at that moment, her friend was um, addicted to drugs and alcohol. She was self-mutilating herself, was contemplating suicide. Allie had no idea when she felt that 
compulsion by the Spirit of God to speak to her and was obedient to that. No idea what she was going through. It was only after she came to church, she expressed some of the things that were going on in her life. We were able to uh, minister to her. And today, she's a teacher, she's a wife, mom, and she's honoring God. And we, uh, I love following along with her life on Facebook. All because Allie was faithful to listen to the Spirit when he spoke and he prompted her. A few years ago, another instance, um, a few years ago, I was in Columbus, Ohio, in a park, and there was a guy, and I felt compelled by the Lord, I know this is weird, but I felt compelled by the Lord to go talk to this guy about Jesus. I was like, oh man, I was like so nervous, and it was me and a friend, and I was so nervous, I was like shaking, I was so nervous, and I walk up to the guy, I said, I started talking to him about Jesus, and um, he, he, um, he was like, oh, this is crazy. I've been praying <laughs> that God would speak to me, and I see this as a sign from God that God would speak to me. We had this great conversation. He really challenged us. Like He wasn't fully on board with Christianity or anything like this. He had some amazing questions that I didn't have all the answers to and all this stuff, but it was a really good conversation. At the end of it, we prayed, and he left, and then we found him later on, and we went and baptized him in the fountain, and there was a miracle, and doves came down, and it was like, no, that's not what happened at all. Prayed for him. He left, and I don't know what happened to him. I, mean, I pray that today he's in a church, and God has been uh, working in his life, and he's doing amazing things, but I have no idea because it's not for me to know. And maybe that day after we prayed, he left, and nothing ever happened. I don't know, but I know that me and my friend were faithful to speak to this guy. There is no miracle at the end of that story. And this is a principle I think that we can get out of this. Obedience is our responsibility, but outcome is God's. Obedience is our responsibility, but outcome is God's. Sometimes you'll see why God prompted you to do it. It'll be like uh, Allie's friend where it's just like, oh, I see what God was doing there. Other times you'll just say yes to God, you'll do it, and you'll never see anything of it. Maybe one day when you get to, to heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ and you are there, maybe you'll see the outcome, but maybe not. Obedience is your responsibility. The outcome is God. Be faithful. God is going to put someone on your heart. Maybe even today, God is going to put someone on your heart. And I'm going to encourage you to, when God does that, respond to him. Respond to that, uh, that, that prompting, that compulsion by the Spirit to do what God tells you to do. Somebody that you're supposed to talk to. Somebody that you're supposed to give to. Somebody that you're supposed to share your faith with. Somebody that you're supposed to bless today. And do it today. Don't. And predecide that faithfulness is not something that we do as people. Faithfulness is something, someone, excuse me, that we are. We are faithful. We're faithful to love people. We're faithful to multiply. We're faithful to obey. Back at 2 4 again. Righteous will live by their faithfulness. I love our church, I love you guys. I look around, I see a lot of hurt and pain and confusion and, and difficulty all around us. And I think to myself, I want to be more effective for Christ in the world. I want to uh, tell more people about him and want more people to follow him because I truly believe that is the best way of life. It's the true path to happiness is following Christ. But sometimes it can feel like it's just not happening fast enough. And maybe you feel that way too, like where you are. You're just like, where I am in life is I'm just not getting where I want to go fast enough. And if you've ever felt that, I'll never forget what a pastor said to me. He said, you'll always overestimate what you can accomplish in the short term, but you will vastly underestimate what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. I always think that we can do more. When it doesn't happen quickly, I worry. Maybe God's not even working. We're always going to underestimate what God can do for a lifetime of faithfulness. Day in, day out, week by week, hour by hour. Be you're going to overestimate what you can do in this season in your marriage. You're going to overestimate what you can do in this season as you're single. You're going to overestimate what it is to uh, be faithful in business or schooling. 
or wherever you are, are right now, but you're going to underestimate what God is going to do through you, through a lifetime of faithfulness. And that's where we, we kind of merge into finishing well next week, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about. What I want to tell you is today, as the Apostle Paul says, press on, continue being faithful, watch God work in your life. You want success, you want happiness, if you want to be moral, you want to be a person of integrity, be faithful. God says, be faithful in a little, we'll put you in charge of it. Maybe that's you today, and you want to pray to be more faithful. Let me ask you, we're going to pray right now. You can pray something like this, say, God, today, make me a faithful person. When you prompt me, I want to obey. What you've blessed me with, I want to multiply. When I walk into a situation or conversation, I want to love. Make me faithful by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Powerful truth in the scriptures today. If you find yourself being unfaithful. You've not always been faithful. God, I got some good news to for you. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, if we are faithless, God remains faithful. If we are faithless, if we haven't been faithful, God remains faithful to us where he cannot deny himself. This is the good news of Jesus, that when we are without faith, Jesus is faithful. The Son of God who died on the cross in our place, gave his life for us, was faithful to the very end. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, that is all the things, all the ways and things that we've done that hurt ourselves, hurt others, and ultimately hurt God. If we confess those things to God, he is faithful and just forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness to make us pure like his son. Today, there are those of you who need to ask forgiveness. You need his grace. You need the faithfulness of God because you have been unfaithful. So what I want you to do is I want you to step away from sin and I want you to step into a relationship with Jesus. You can honor him today. Call on the name of Jesus. For those of you that say, I need his faithfulness and grace, call on him. I'm going to lead us in one more prayer. Ask everybody to bow their heads again. You can pray this. God, forgive me of every single sin that I've done. Make me new. I believe you died for my sin. Resurrected from the dead. I want to follow you and hold. It is in Jesus' name. Amen. This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com.